that mining conditions are very, very important to understand. Um, in 1913, on average, one man per week died in the mines. So you lose 50 to 55 men a year in the mines. Deaths in the mines are commonplace, so much so that if you go through the newspapers at the time, earlier today as in the tech archives uh, basement over there, looking at uh, coroner's inquests from 1910, 1912, 1913, 14, and literally it's just some man got killed by falling rock, another man fell down a mine shaft, another man got hit by this and died, another man got, you know, and the, the number of deaths were so commonplace, um, it's hard to imagine today. Today we have OSHA and my OSHA and laws that protect workers. They didn't exist back then. So uh, this is an example of some men working underground. And you'll notice the right there's a man crying rock off the ceiling using a bar. That's the low jack approach. And the right, excuse me, the left the man's using a pneumatic or a steam power drill, depending on which one it is. Uh, and they're starting to introduce more machinery down there. But mining was still a relatively uh, primitive, extremely dangerous occupation. Every man who got killed in the mines, there were 10 men severely injured. Mm -hmm. And you have to remember that these are, these are government statistics. That when they talk about severe injuries in 1910 or 1913, we're talking about men losing limbs or being blinded or having their backs broken. Uh, nowadays, you know, you, you stub your toe, you think you're injured. Okay, so there's 10 serious injuries per death and 100 minor injuries per death back then. So extremely dangerous working conditions. So, here's an example of, of, a, of a working condition that I like to point out. The roof is held up by uh, timbers, and timbers there have collapsed, and the mine is partially caved in. We don't know if anybody died or not. These guys here, obviously, they survived it, and uh, work will go on. Um, but as a result of the conditions in the mines, and the mining conditions, um, the Western Federation of Miners came into town and started gathering up um, uh, union members and agitating to get members to unionize. Uh, prior to that, there had been some efforts to unionize the miners, but they hadn't been that successful. And among the people that were in the mines that I like to talk about are the trammers. Because if you showed up in this area, whether you could speak English or not, if you were able-bodied, you could get a job at any mine up and down the entire range by simply walking up and indicating to them somehow that you're willing to work. And they'd give you this job. This man right here is a trammer. He's pushing a tram car filled with rocks. He'll do this for eight or ten hours a day, probably ten hours a day before the strike. Um, and he get paid by the weight of the rock he moved. And this is one of the examples of things I like to point out, is that none of the mines had scales under premises. You would push your rocks up to the mine boss, and you dump them out, and you look at it and go, ah, 500 pounds, and you make a little note. And next thing you push the thing rocks up, and you look at it, ah, 480 pounds. Eyeballing how much stuff you move and you got paid by the weight. And when the Bureau of Labor actually did an investigation the year after the strike, they found it so amazing that this system was in place every single mine up and down the range. None of them used scales. But it was that kind of a problem you had where the workers showed up for work and did their jobs. And mine management ran the places, but there's this huge disconnect. And it was in that setting that the Western Federation of Miners actually came in and got enough traction to unionize. Um, so, in the summer of 1913, there you go, we have a request. Um, in 1913, the Western Federation of Miners came into town um, and actually managed to get enough people to join the unions where they thought that they could call a strike effectively if they needed to. They sent a letter, uh, an identical letter, to each of the miners up and down the range. Uh, in the name of the union and said, in essence, we want to meet with you to discuss working conditions. Uh, how many hours we work in a day, what we get paid by the hour, um, and we also want to have a way to air our grievances. And the airing of grievances is, is something that often gets overlooked, but if you think about it, if you're a trammer and you're pushing your rocks all day long and you're convinced that the guy is not giving you what you're entitled to, who do you complain to? Because he's your boss, you complain to him. Of course, he's not going to disagree with himself. So you have this friction that occurs in mines. So they send the letter to mine management, and mine management at that time refused to, to, meet, to meet with or negotiate with the unions. So they actually either just disregarded the letters, a couple letters got sent back unopened, um, but 
they did not respond at all to the union. And the thinking at the time was, and this is common in industry in America that's encouraging, that you don't negotiate with a union, even telling them no is a form of negotiation, and you don't want to even recognize that they have the right to speak on behalf of a group of workers. So they ignored the demand, and so the strikers, the workers went out on strike. So we have a, a, a July 23rd, 1913, the uh, strike is called the Western Federation of Miners. 